at work, generally have a sort of cloudy outlook on things of being cloud security engineer. Um, I am also an AWS certified solutions architect professional grade, which means uh, that I have definitely drunk the cloud Kool-Aid and I get 20% more LinkedIn spam because of it. <laughs> All right, so uh, a little agenda. Uh, we'll talk about why this is important. We'll talk about uh, some background on AWS and EC2, the sort of all the acronym soup that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, we'll level set with that, talk about the research uh, methodology, what I found, and then also talk about the chain of custody and protecting that forensic data. So one of the values that we have at Twilio is start with why. Um, this is one of, my, one of my favorite corporate values that we hold. So why? Well, um, sometimes um, bad things happen. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to swear or not, but you can fill in. Um, yeah, compromises are a fact of life, unfortunately. Um, and I, I really like this slide because that to-do uh, was there like the first time I started putting the slide deck together and I meant to update it. And then just every single time there's like a new security issue every day, every week, there's just always another one. Like, you know, Newegg, Facebook, um, there was like 730 kajillion email addresses and passwords that got leaked yesterday or last week sometimes. So just, this is sort of the, unfortunately, but this is the, the world that we live in nowadays. Uh, and prevention is ideal in these circumstances, but detection is a must. Uh, we, as security professionals, um, or people interested in security, uh, or people that just showed up because um, you thought that the food looked good, uh, if something bad happens, we need to be able to figure out how bad that thing was. Um, someone comes, law enforcement knocks on the door, or uh, your boss gives you a phone call, says, hey, something happened. You gotta figure out the extent of it. So um, a forensic investigation is when we investigate some event that happened in the past and use scientific techniques to do so. Uh, we don't wanna be developing these techniques after the event. Doing this sort of stuff, rushing into it ad hoc, can mean loss of information, loss of data, uh, general confusion. Um, it, it's really not a good time to be, while things are, are on fire, trying to figure out, uh, if I put water on it, am I just gonna make it worse? Um, all of you out there with electric cars, be real careful with those lithium batteries. Personally, uh, I also think what is hidden is a lot more interesting than what's visible. Uh, if an attacker has gone in and um, just started mining Bitcoin on your servers. That's sort of interesting. Um, but what's more interesting is, did they try and cover their tracks? Did they delete log files? Did they try and overwrite portions of the disk and try and really prevent me uh, from coming in later or prevent any of you coming in later and understanding just what did they try and do? Um, I find that the more interesting part of forensic techniques. So, Personally, um, uh, all of these things like it's in the, the cloud is sort of this mystery uh, that's, that's happening. So uh, when we talk about the cloud, um, this is just really high level overview. We're gonna talk about predominantly AWS. Um, how many people here use AWS on like a daily basis? A few of you, Google Cloud, Azure, a few others. So some of these techniques can be applied to the other cloud platforms. Um, I'm most familiar with AWS and that's sort of the dominant player in the market right now, but nothing is inherently limited just to AWS. Uh, how many of you work with like on-prem sites? Okay, some of you just don't work with computers at all, it looks like. Let me come up afterwards, let me know how you do that because I'd love to know. Uh, so this is not gonna be an introductory course in AWS. This isn't gonna be an advanced course. Um, there's just a ton of AWS <laughs> services. This is, if you log into the console, this is what it looked like a few weeks ago. Um, then Amazon had their conference and made it even bigger and more complicated. We're gonna focus just on a few of their uh, top level services. Uh, EC2, which is Elastic Cloud Compute. EBS, Elastic Block Storage. IAM, which is Identity and Access Management. And S3, the Simple Storage Service. Uh, we'll go in a little bit more detail these uh, in a little bit. In case you missed it the first time, that's where they're all hidden up on the console. Um, it's, this is a, a UI UX disaster. 
So, uh, Elastic Cloud Compute, what is EC2? Uh, it's virtual machines on demand. You, uh, they actually even have physical bare metal hardware now, which is interesting, but um, they come in all different sizes, shapes, colors, capacities, CPU, RAM, so on and so forth. And uh, essentially, you can go to that console, you can log in, say, I want an Amazon account, here's my credit card, uh, click a button, and you get a server. They also have an API. So you can make a, uh, you can hit that API with a script, and you'll get a server with your whatever configurations you wanted. If you have a script with a loop in it, you can hit the API and get a whole bunch of servers uh, up until at least your sort of spending limit that Amazon enforces on you for your own safety. Uh, so the, these are all virtual machines, uh, which means that they, sh by default, share tenancy. Uh, if you want to pay more, then you can get various degrees of dedicated tenancy and hardware associated just for you um, and not share the hypervisor with anyone else. The starting point, the base point which one of these EC2 servers uh, comes from is an, uh, an AMI, an Amazon Machine Image. So uh, these AMIs contain the host operating system configuration. It's basically like a, the, the golden boot image for a EC2 server. It's really interesting because you can go ahead and create a uh, AMI from a running instance. So if you configure something and let's set up how you want it to, you can then go ahead and click on that and say, all right, this is my, my golden image. Uh, this is what I want to start from. Um, so some other things about EC2. Uh, some instances have instance storage, and some of them don't. Uh, this is uh, an ephemeral, directly attached disk. So your hardware out there, or your, the virtual hardware that you have, um, is going to have these virtual hard drives associated with them. We'll talk about those next. But there's also uh, some instances have physically attached hardware to them. It's really fast, but it's also completely ephemeral. Uh, you, that instance is shut down or terminated, and all the data on that volume is gone. No way of getting it back. And that has some uh, repercussions for us when we try and do forensics. The alternative is elastic block storage, EBS. Uh, and this is um, basically a virtually, uh, virtually attached disk. Um, it's, you get to specify a volume, it's not preset, like ephemeral storage. You say, I want this many gigabytes, and I want this kind of capacity, and I want it attached to a uh, certain you know, dev XVDA G or H uh, on my virtual instance. You get to set all of that up. It's, it is network attached storage, but it shows up as though it were local uh, uh, attached to your instance. Uh, it can be on either the uh, PCIe or the uh, NVMe bus. Uh, sorry, SATA or NVMe buses, um, which is kind of interesting that like you have this network attached stuff that presents as if it were tr like super local to the the virtual machine. It doesn't know that it's network uh, storage. There's all kinds of things in the background. So this is the general eye chart of the matrix of what um, the different types are. So Standard was sort of Gen 1, then they came out with Gen 2, which is all these other uh, crazy names. They're all backed by different mediums, so some of them are hard drives, some of them are solid state disk. They've got different maximum sizes and throughputs in terms of burst and peak, all this stuff. Uh, but the interesting bit is that they all have the exact same annualized failure rate. No matter what you do, uh, Amazon says that these drives are going to fail between 0.1 and 0.2% of the time. Um, so, all right. Elastic block storage, Amazon says annual failure rate is less than 0.2%. If you go down and you drive to the store or order one off of Amazon and it shows up at your doorstop, that's going to have an annualized failure rate of about 4%. If you go and you read up on all the different hard drive manufacturers. So this is where it starts to get interesting from an a investigative point of view. Um, EBS, Amazon is guaranteeing, is about 20 times more durable than a regular off-the-shelf drive. How do they do it? Um, well, they won't tell me, but some kind of evil voodoo, I'm sure, is involved. Um, but you, so EBS, 
right? It's disk storage, which is actually network attached storage. It's got all these different capabilities, all these different backing stores, all different ways of being attached to an instance. It can be moved between instances. It's durable. Um, and it fails a 20th as often as if you went out and you have hard drives in your data center uh, or the data center under your desk, all these different things. And the most important part, for, at least from a forensic standpoint, is that we can take a snapshot of it with an API call. There's no need to go and, and press a button and send someone out in the data center to go and like grab a hard drive and make sure that it gets uh, imaged properly. It's an API call away. OK, so hold that thought. The other, uh, some more level setting, uh, identity and access management. This is how we do permission controls in AWS. They're really fine grained. It's really cool what you can do. Uh, there are some lacking parts of it, which I bug my Amazon friends about whenever I can. But it lets you essentially say who can make what API calls and which resources you can make those API calls on. For example, like creating new instances. Not everyone maybe should have the uh, capability to go out and launch some $25 a minute instance. Might want to restrict that uh, unless someone else is paying the bill. But you can also do things like the snapshots for EBS volumes. The ability to control that is done through I, uh, IAM. And this becomes really important when we need to protect the chain of custody and be able to say that, yes, this snapshot that was taken hasn't been tampered with. Uh, anyone out here has had to deal with writing IAM policies? All right, a couple of hands. Yeah. Uh, it's this JSON-based language. Um, it's really com complex. Uh, it's, it's gotten a little bit easier, um, but all of you who have been having to deal with IAM, um, come meet my support group. We'll meet at the bar later after this talk. Let's talk about S3, simple storage service. Uh, S3 is a simple key value store. I have some object, some binary blob, and I want to store it at some particular key, some address in S3. When you take a snapshot, or you ask Amazon to take a snapshot uh, of an EBS volume for you, uh, it's stored in a special magic place in S3. Uh, it's not using any sort of deep hidden features or secrets of, Am of Amazon. It's stored in S3 like any other bit of data, just a special place that you don't have regular access to. When we trigger these snapshots, it doesn't have to be when the disk is detached in an offline state. Um, it can be hot and running. The snapshots will take a little bit longer, but Amazon will still let you do it. Uh, they will give you a warning that says, hey, you might have inconsistent data. Um, I haven't really encountered that with really, really high throughput devices. And on EBS, you might see that. Um, but for the most part, it's uh, uh, snapshotting active volumes is going to result in uh, a, a healthy snapshot, something that you can deal with later. A very cool feature of these snapshots, too, is that they are immutable. If you take a snapshot and then uh, you let that disk run for another hour, two hours, you can take another snapshot. And only the difference between those two states is going to be incorporated in the snapshot. So from a sort of outside of the forensic standpoint, you could use this for backups and just take a snapshot every hour, every day. And you're only billed for that difference in storage. Uh, you don't have to worry about, are you going to edit or uh, mess up your old backups because you have that snapshot? Conveniently also, from a forensic standpoint, uh, you can take multiple snapshots of something and see how perhaps an, a, you know, an attacker has changed their techniques over time. Uh, or if you just want to kick them out, you could do a difference between the two snapshots. In any case, we know that the snapshot that's taken is given a unique identifier and can't be changed. It is guaranteed to, uh, to not be tampered with. Doesn't mean it can't be deleted, and we'll get into that later. But at least you're going to have the same bits um, in that snapshot. And um, AMIs are just simple, uh, special EBS snapshots. They've been uh, blessed to be a boot volume, but they are uh, effectively just snapshots. Um, the, when you launch an, uh, an EC2 instance, um, the, that AMI can be uh, either based out of the EBS volume attached to an instance or off the ephemeral storage if it's equipped. It's still coming from the uh, a same image, just with slightly different parameters. 
Uh, oh, so I talked about snapshot versioning. Uh, I got ahead of myself. Um, so uh, one caveat to this is, let's say you take 10 snapshots of something, and then you think, well, I really don't need that middle three, four, five snapshots, whatever it is. That's a really painful operation to undertake because you've now have, uh, you're breaking the links in the middle. If you're going to be messing around with snapshots, uh, start from either the beginning or the end of your chain, uh, because then otherwise Amazon's got to compute the diffs of not just between, say, three and four, but the diff between three and five, and that was being tracked through four, which you've just asked them to get rid of for you. Uh, so think of the poor people have to work in these data centers comparing the bits. Only start from the beginning or the end. All right, so um, let's play a little story. Uh, We've got Miss Scarlet and Mr. Green, Colonel Mustard, Miss White. Anyone played Clue before? American board game? Yeah. Uh, so, right, this is just completely fic fictional. We're just playing around. Clue is a Milton Bradley game. EBS is an Amazon game. Um, but the, the point of Clue, the objective is uh, you are trying to figure out who done it. Uh, there has been... Uh, and this is a children's game, um, but there's been a murder committed and you're trying to solve it. I don't really, as a child, this seemed perfectly normal, but as an adult, I look back on it and I think it's a little bit odd. Uh, so, but each square, this is what the clue board looks like, we can pretend is like a sector, is a certain part of a hard drive. And what we can do uh, is we can kind of um, torture this analogy a little bit and say that Right? In the clue game, we're trying to figure out who's committed this murder. In forensics, we're trying to figure out who's modified uh, some part of a hard drive. File's been overwritten, deleted. Um, is it possible to, to investigate and find out, can we get that information back? Uh, so, for example, did, was it Miss White erasing log files in the library? Or was it Colonel Mustard in the kitchen who was forcing log files to roll over to try and hide his nefarious tracks? Uh, so if only we could see past turns on the clue board. Well, that's what forensics is pretty much all about, trying to investigate and see if we can recover this data. So um, here are the, the questions that I kind of went into this. Question one is if there's a snapshot of an EBS volume taken, right? use the Amazon API calls, will that snapshot contain only in-use blocks, things that we know we've written a file to? or are gonna, these deleted blocks going to be included as well? Does it matter the original volume type? Uh, has Amazon changed their implementation between the generation one and generation two and these, all these different generation two style instances? And three, does the instance type matter? Some of these instances, it's NVMe, some of them, uh, it's SATA. Does that make a difference to us at all? So, um, the process that uh, I went through was grab a bunch of EC2 instances, attach an EVS volume to them of different types, write some known seed files, delete those seed files, take a snapshot of the, um, the EVS volume that I was writing to, rehydrate that snapshot to a new clean EVS volume, and then uh, go looking for the files. So uh, because this is all done through APIs, I wrote a script. Um, that just launched a whole bunch of these instances for me. Uh, this is sort of what that looks like if you haven't seen the Amazon console. Um, launch a bunch of these, uh, run the script, these all start showing up. Wait for them to boot. Um, I used another Amazon service to help me actually run the commands, which is really just simply grab my known seed files out of S3, write them to disk, make sure that they are really written to disk by sort of waiting and forcing the OS to flush its file buffers, delete those files, uh, and then continue on. So anyway, uh, that all runs OK. And because um, I'm not made of money and I didn't get reimbursed for my own personal sort of investigations, uh, shut them all down. Because otherwise, Amazon will very happily keep charging you by the minute these are still alive. So the faster they're dead, uh, the better for me. <laughs> So uh, in, our, in our analogy, uh, right, we could log into the sort of the clue board and take a snapshot of the board uh, and then go ahead and do investigations to see which players have moved around on which sectors uh, and you know, what, what actions have they taken. To do this investigation, I used PhotoRec. 
Uh, it's freely available software. It's really well written. Uh, it was originally designed to recover photos from like a camera's memory cards. Um, it's very good at that, but it's also very good at finding a bunch of other, uh, other file types. And it does this by looking at sort of just reading the raw blocks of a disk and looking for certain file signatures, certain ordered patterns of data. Uh, so again, there's 20 plus different combinations that I tested. I didn't want to do this all by hand. So again, more scripting, more APIs. Um, the script would take each snapshot that I had done, rehydrate that to a, a brand new EBS volume, attach that new volume to an instance, and then run PhotoRec for me and look at the deleted files. So this is just sort of that script. It runs and it does a bunch of things. Um, the matrix effect looks cool, uh, but there's not really a whole lot of like super valuable data here. So let's get into the really cool stuff then. Uh, let's talk about results. Heaps and heaps of files show up in the recovery directory, way more than I was expecting. Uh, and when I looked, it was not just my sort of expected seed files. It was um, some of them were the seed files. It's text files, uh, JPEG files, audio files, font files, PDFs. Um, and I didn't know how they got there. So let's take a quick step back. And the process that I did, um, I said I was going to attach a different EBS volume to each class of instance, which I did do. Uh, but Originally, it was um, applying each one of a, just as the base AMI. Yeah, I want you to launch this instance and use this AMI. I'm going to write it to the root volume. Well, remember how I said that AMIs are snapshots too? They've got deleted files. Um, in fact, they can have a long, long history of files that have been there. If an AMI has been used, and then that was the base image for another AMI, and another AMI, and another AMI, um, that could be. Uh, a lot of deleted files that have just sort of accumulated over time. So if you are doing this, if you're trying to do forensics and you're looking at a root EBS volume, be prepared to see tons and tons and tons of deleted files. Um, and the Clue OS game board analogy is getting really stretched here, but um, it's sort of like if every single time you played the game, you could see that history. Uh, this is potentially a very overwhelming amount of files. And that's because AMIs are snapshots. AMIs have deleted files. Uh, and you'll get them back, uh, which is very, very cool from a forensic standpoint. But at the same time, if you take the academic curiosity out of it, uh, it could be just impossible to find what you're really looking for, right? Two lines in a log file that had been deleted, or some malicious dropper that's erased itself. Uh, you might be uh, too much noise for your signal. So uh, I reran this and I used clean volumes instead to do my, uh, my analysis work on to make it easier for me to make sure that files were getting back. So um, matching hashes. How do we know that right, the seed files I wrote to disk were actually coming back? Because uh, even if I wasn't using uh, a root EBS, so I'm using a brand new clean uh, EBS volume. I was getting, I wrote some 42-ish files to disk, and I was getting back uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Why? Well, it's because sometimes files don't have really clear, um, clear file markers, where things end, where one file ends and a new file begins. And uh, Photorec is just doing its best guesswork. So for example, um, text files, right? Text files. Just you start by writing bits to a disk, and there's not really a clear start or end point. Um, this is a better example of that. So this is a, a listing, uh, just a free file I found was um, the a bunch of uh, flights uh, over the course of one day in the US. So just ordered CSV. But to Photorec, this just looks like text. And it doesn't know that these two files found at different places on the disk were actually uh, part of the same file. Uh, originally, it doesn't know that. So that's how I ended up with way more files. So how do I know if I got these files back? Um, so my comparison was just to see the first n bytes, um, you know, take different values to sort of get different confidence uh, to see how many of the original files were recovered. So um, if we compare 
about like the first uh, 300 or so uh, bytes, and we look at the different instance types and the volume types, we can see that there's um, a, a lot of matches. I guess 56 is my original number of seed files. Uh, and so I ran this analysis to see if I was getting different results back. Uh, and again, this is the cool scrolling text. The upshot, right? What the actual important part of this? Uh, didn't matter what instance type I was. So whether it was SATA or NVMe, didn't matter. But the volume type did matter. I got the best recovery rates from standard GP2 and IO1 type volumes. Uh, and I, I don't say bad, but just less good was from SC1 and ST1 type volumes. Uh, and that kind of, you can see that here. So um, 11 and 25 um, files versus 52, 48. I mean, we're talking, right, 80% 80, 80 plus recovery on the other volume types, which is really, really good. Um, and in here, we're talking like between 20 to 50% successful recovery. And again, your mileage may vary. Uh, please try this at home, but your results may differ, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was the, the volume types. Um, and there's, there were some other oddities that showed up as well. For example, when I was recovering from the SC1 and ST1 type drives, I got massive PDF files. No other file type uh, that I encountered had this problem, but PDF, uh, one PDF in particular on these volumes would just grow and fill up. Like the whole entire drive was this one PDF. Um, and like if you don't speak, um, yeah, so 272 gigabytes used on one PDF. Um, I, and this is sort of a, a, just a cross of different um, volume types and instance types. And if you don't translate bytes to gigabytes in your head, which I don't blame you, it's not a good skill to have, then you can see like um, in this run, the ST1 drives were 161, 24, 21 gigs. Um, massive, massive files. Um, and I don't know, uh, that .mp4 file at the bottom there was the same across both. Um, like that was fine, got the whole file back. Um, but the, the PDF, I can promise you is not anywhere near as even the maybe a megabyte or two at most. I, I'll show you it later. Um, and so this is why. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's some, so the SC1 and ST1 drives are for a sort of sustained throughput. They're large bulk files uh, or large bulk drives. Um, minimum size is 500 gigs. But uh, I, I don't have a good reason why only those suffered from this artifact. Uh, there's some theories. It could be that the end of file marker, like if, if it's a striped disk, the end of file marker is a few disks away from the beginning file marker. Uh, but it only showed up on these volumes, so these volumes are then have a different implementation, and it is uh, all speculation and guesswork. Um, and that's what the file looks like. Just it's a test image. That was it. So we've covered uh, that we it is possible to recover files from these disks. There are some weird edge cases to be aware of, but let's also talking about not dropping the ball also known as keeping a chain of custody uh, of the data on these disks. So those EBS snapshots that I talked about that get pushed into S3 on your behalf, those can be shared to other accounts. And this is really key because if someone's in, has broken into your AWS account, they, if they have those IAM permissions, could conceivably delete those snapshots. Uh, if you had a malicious attacker in your account and they want to be very sure that you aren't doing anything, then they could just keep listing out snapshots. Oh, someone's creating a snapshot called forensics. I'm going to issue a delete call to that. So we want to keep these snapshots safe. And the best way to do that is by copying them to another account. So we've talked about IAM a little bit and uh, JSON everywhere that it has. Uh, permissions matter. Some permissions matter more than others. 
if you want to know your snapshots are untampered, then don't leave them where there's that po even a possibility of tampering. Where is that? It's not like we can go in and take one of these snapshots and it's on a secured volume and you get the intern and you say, all right, handcuff this to your wrist and don't let go. Um, one, it's mean to do that to your interns and then they won't be able to get you coffee because they've got a hard drive attached to their wrist. But um, like in the cloud, we don't have, we still have interns. We don't have the capability. <laughs> We don't have the capability of, uh, keep, of keeping these snapshots like physically secured with locks and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, we have to use w the tools we're given, which in this case is IAM. This isn't going to be a like basics of securing your Amazon account, um, but I'll, I'll try and cover just sort of what you need to know. So IAM, we've got the permissions, principles, and policies, uh, the who, what, where, when, and how. This is that way you can say that only kernel mustard is allowed to interact with Lambda functions in the lobby. You can set and the phase required, IP range, particular resources, etc. cetera. Um, how many of you recognize this policy? For those of you, <laughs> this is the admin policy. This says that <laughs> you can do any API call on any resource at any time from anywhere. Um, and if this is such a helpful policy, like you never hit permission errors with this. Uh, on the same token, if you grant this to something that an attacker has access to, then they're going to also be very grateful that you didn't bother locking it down. Uh, this is an example. This is just the permissions I granted to my EC2 instances to let them grab the seed files. Um, this bucket is not public, uh, which seems to be a recurring issue these days. But um, AWS accounts are essentially blast walls. They form these walls around your account. And an explosion that happens, or sorry, um, an attack that breaches one account can't reach other accounts. This is the concept of blast radius. It is a hard barrier. Uh, the only way you can get access to a different AWS account is going to be through compromising other credentials. So do you know what's on that instance? Has some developer just been like, oh, either one, granted it the, those permissions inherently, so that instance can make these API calls, or two, they were having some trouble, and so they just put static credentials on that, that instance. They checked it into your internal version control, which they shouldn't have done, but it was just this one thing, and then they pushed the code up, and now there's static credentials that are sitting on that instance. Uh, well, an, an attacker can very easily, like there's some standard locations for these files, uh, they can just grep through everything and look for the pattern. We don't know what's on that instance, and we don't know what permissions that instance either was imbued with or has somehow managed to acquire over time. So don't take chances. This is what happens potentially to an AWS account that has been breached. Um, this is not necessarily a great demonstration of blast radius if you live on this planet, but if you've kept everything else separated into multiple planets, then the loss of one planet is going to sting, but it's not going to take out all life on Earth or your whole company. So, uh, again, we want to know, we want to be sure that our forensic snapshots can't be within the same area, the same blast that takes out everything else, we need these snapshots somewhere else. Uh, the easiest way to do that is uh, to put it into a different AWS account. There are some other ways of managing access. Um, CloudTrail is a great way of, it records all the API calls, lets you know who's done what uh, from where. It's very, very useful, but it is um, an after, after the fact sort of analysis. Uh, and the same rules apply to CloudTrail. If you have CloudTrail writing to the same account that CloudTrail is trying to monitor, then that is not good if someone is, manages to tamper with those files. There's file integrity that you can have available, but um, it doesn't do you much good if you get an alert that says, yep, your files, there's CloudTrail has been modified. Great. Who modified it? Push us all into other accounts. So. Um, as an example, right, let's say we have this EC2 instance, the orange block up there, and the red block up there is the EBS volume attached to it. 
and there's been uh, some compromise. So we say, all right, let's take a snapshot of it, right? I'm an incident responder. I'm going to use my powers. I'm going to say, take a snapshot of that disk. So Amazon will go ahead, uh, do exactly what we've asked, and they'll push that, uh, take a snapshot, push it into S3. But I don't know that there's API keys that have been left around. The attacker has a back door. They've escalated their permissions. Um, maybe the attacker is really an, an insider, right? The sysadmin's got a pretty good feeling today is going to be his last day. So let's make sure that um, definitely is after this. Make sure that uh, you know cover covers his tracks, whatever it is. So if they have those API keys, then they can go ahead and uh, burn everything in that account down if they have the policies to permissions to do so. Uh, this includes that snapshot that we were hoping to use to figure out who's performed this compromise. Um, so separate account. Now we take the snapshot, same thing. It gets pushed into S3 on our behalf. But now, as soon as it's complete, we tell Amazon, I need you to copy that into a, a different account. We uh, basically, you say share to the separate account. In the separate account there, we say copy the snapshot. Now this second account on the right is the owner of a clean snapshot. Uh, even if our attacker shows up, and even if they try and burn everything else down, um, there's still going to be a snapshot in a separate account. And their credentials are only valid within one account. So they don't have the capability to actually interact with that snapshot, which will probably make your attacker sad. Uh, but this is definitely good news for us on the security side of the fence. So takeaways, what does your threat model look like? If you need high quality forensics, you need to be able to guarantee that, yes, no matter what happens, I can go back in time and I can, uh, I can see exactly what someone has done. Then um, if that is part of your threat assessment, don't use ephemeral storage. It can't be snapshotted. It is gone as soon as that instance is terminated. If you lose shell access to that instance, uh, someone is disabled or just broken SSH, um, or God help you Telnet, then you've lost the ability to take any kind of snapshot of that disk. You can still use DD or other kind of tools like that, um, but it's, it's local file storage, and it is in no way uh, durable. The SC1 and ST1 EBS volumes, they've got some weird artifact issues. Um, this maybe isn't really a problem for you um, for the kind of data that you're storing, but it's probably worth investigating and seeing, hey, if I need to do a, a forensic investigation of this data, what, is, um, what am I going to get back? Is, is, am I going to have these same artifact issues? Uh, if you don't need super high quality forensics, um, you're OK with uh, maybe some of these artifacts. You're OK and you've accepted losing the uh, if some of the ephemeral storage, then that's fine. Just know the limitations uh, so that way when there is an event, you understand what's possible. Consider only allowing writes to non-root EBS volumes. Uh, so the AMI that you launch is going to have all this history. It's a lot of noise. Um, and most of it just isn't simply that interesting. It's just going to be there and getting in your way when you're trying to find a log that you, your application, has put down there. So it's writing to clean new EBS volumes completely eliminates this problem of recovering and getting all these artifacts back. Um, you, if, you can do recovery on root EBS volumes, but it's going to be much more targeted. Um, you're going to have to know and, and look for a very high quality uh, signal that you know about ahead of time um, to be able to cut through all the noise. Uh, and finally, use multiple AWS accounts. Um, a breach of one EC2 server could potentially the mean could could potentially mean the loss of everything in that account. Uh, the loss of a single API key could mean the loss of all of your stuff. Uh, developers um, and even like 
all of us that work in, in cloud-based things have API keys. They're on that laptop or emailed to someone. If you're really, uh, people don't uh, understand, but like if that's on a laptop and that laptop walks away or is left unlocked, uh, it's API key and secret. And that's what you need to really royally screw up someone's account. Accounts limit the blast radius. That API key is good in one account, not good to multiple accounts. Having multiple accounts means that each API key, no matter if it is that admin permission that's just so tempting and saying, hey, you'll never get a permission error with me, use me, uh, the, the sirens call, um, it's still gonna be a, a limit around it if you have multiple accounts. Know what the blast radius of something is and keep your forensics out of that blast radius. Uh, if you're doing your forensics work and it's being snapshots put in the same account as your uh, potentially compromised instance, then sure, granted, the, um, there won't be modifications to that snapshot. It could just be completely deleted, um, which I suppose is one very big type of modification. Finally, uh, enable CloudTrail. Um, this will give you a record of everything that's happened in your accounts. You'll be able to know uh, who's done what, uh, it's really, really useful. And even just from a troubleshooting standpoint, uh, sometimes Amazon updates their permissions and doesn't update their documentation. And the first step is always to go and see what error you got um, to, uh, to sort through that. Um, finally, be careful what you write to uh, an AMI, um, especially if you're gonna create an AMI and then share it out to people uh, through the Amazon marketplace, through customers, even internal clients. Uh, if part of your steps are to be writing secrets to that uh, AMI, um, probably best to change that process and keep that AMI clean. If you write sensitive information to that AMI as part of the baking process, it is potentially recoverable. There'll be a lot of noise obscuring it. Um, it may not be a successful recovery of that particular file with that particular time, uh, but be aware that this is a, a possibility. So. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I will take questions, but just a, a few quick things. Um, we're hiring. Uh, if you're interested, if you think that you could potentially tolerate working with people like me, uh, then please um, go ahead. We have a bug bounty program. Um, please, please, please come pound on our doors. See if you can hack us. Uh, we pay. Um, we're definitely like getting bug bounty reports. Uh, and uh, if you te text AppSec CA to uh, this phone number, then you can get my business card. Uh, so yeah, questions? Yeah. I think she's going to bring the mic so that way they can. Sure. Uh, using multiple accounts is, uh -huh. is great. But what kind of strategy would you recommend in regard to that? So you could, for example, use organizations mm -hmm. and then use roles to escalate into those. Or you could also separate, create separate accounts, which creates the problem of managing all of those different accounts. Yeah. If you go the latter route, what tools would you recommend? This is a rabbit hole that could be its very, own. Very long. Its own, yeah. This could be, that okay. could be its own talk. Well, um, maybe maybe so I, give a brief answer. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about that later. Definitely. Offline. Um, so there are, there are pros and cons of organizations. It does make it very easy to create those accounts um, and then uh, to assume a role into it. Um, assuming a role, if you don't know the, the Amazon lingo, is basically a way of saying, uh, I can trust a particular entity to get time-limited credentials and those API keys into uh, my account. Um, those can be limited, I think, from 15 to 60 minutes, uh, which is uh, the sort of preferred way of getting into an account because then you don't have static credentials. You can do enforcement of MFA at the, uh, the front door instead of requiring it on all the different API actions downstream. Um, it depends on, on your systems and how they're orchestrated and whether you're using things like Lambda versus EC2 versus Fargate versus just S3. Um, there are some really good open source tools out there uh, that kind of can help you keep an eye on all of this. Um, there are vendors who uh, can help um, uh, can help you, basically you give them money and they solve part of this problem for you for 
keeping track of simple things. So if you have one account, it's very easy to log in and run a script and see, oh, who's opened up uh, port 22 to the world? If you have 10 accounts, it's doable, but it's a little bit more painful. If you have 100 or 1,000 accounts, uh, then you very quickly pass the point of this being scalable. And you need um, some kind of uh, solution that can assume roles into these accounts and do that monitoring for you. Um, hopefully, that, that's brief enough to give some, some kind of color. But there's, um, it's, really, uh, it's a really good question. And it's not one that there's a simple, this is something to think about. Yeah. While I understand the concern about API keys, yeah. um, isn't making multiple accounts broadening your, let's say, uh, target, meaning you would have to secure each one of those and go over it? And how do you handle that? Automation. Ruthless automation. Um, you, you're right. Uh, like, even like with organizations, right? You can say, "Build me this account," and it will build you an account. But it's going to be a, a bog standard AWS account. You're not going to. You're going to have to then set that account up according to how your organization has security policies. Um, if step one is enable CloudTrail, uh, then you got to go and enable CloudTrail in, in every new account. Uh, the good news for this is that Amazon provides APIs for all this stuff. And as part of that sort of creation process, uh, figure out what, what needs to be done and then um, and automate it. And the first thing you do is, once that account is built, go through, run your tooling, uh, delete the pre-configured default stuff you need to, uh, inject whatever tooling you need to, and do all that before you hand it over to uh, your, uh, your internal customers or whoever else on the team uh, needs that access. And then also automate your detection. Um, use tooling to review and make sure that they haven't turned off CloudTrail, that they haven't uh, disabled your security access. And I presume that your automation also updates anything like documentation-wise and uh, Amazon-wise automatically through all the accounts? Um, I'm not quite sure I'm, I'm following that, that question. So uh, if, say, something, you have to change something mm -hmm. in your configuration, yeah. does that go out to all accounts at once? Or how does uh, the automation work? So uh, again, good question. Could be the, t the subject of its own talk. Um, okay, uh, because there's, there's different strategies on how you do this. Um, there's, uh, you definitely want to automate. You definitely want to maybe not push a new Technique or new, new a change to everyone out at once, but uh, you know, start with some test accounts and then roll that out to the broader uh, organization, depending on on how many accounts you have. Um, if you have some accounts that are maybe no compute accounts, that's no EC2, Fargate, containers, Lambda, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just maybe S3 or just maybe um, RDS. Then. You may apply different policies to those, but knowing, knowing what you've got and then knowing what you want it to look like and then um, building that bridge to make sure that you can keep updating these accounts as things change. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, you started out um, by saying the different results you got from the different you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, snapshots that you had and so on. Do you have any idea how much of those results, and then especially the the issue you had with the PDF, is mm -hmm. related to the tool you were using? I forgot the name about it, but if, if you have any idea mm -hmm. about you know better tools that may have hopefully better results when you're doing actual forensics. Yeah. So um, I I only encountered it with those two drive types and that particular PDF file. Um, I didn't try multiple multiple tools. Um, but with uh, all the other testing I did, um, it could be an issue with, with PhotoRec, definitely. Um, I, I don't want to discount that. But I don't have any way of saying one way or the other, whether it's the tool or the nature of the drive. The fact that other uh, EBS volumes of different types didn't have that Art, that sort of artifacting issue um, inclines me to think that it was something to do with how these drives are, are managed in the back end mysterious 
black magic world of Amazon. Um, but yeah, uh, if you if you try this out with different tools, um, then be interested in, uh, in hearing what happens. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So based on your research, do you have any um, advice for, say, attackers on how to, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, prevent uh, or you know destroy evidence or you know say you get a shell on a box mm -hmm. uh, can you figure out metadata for what type of drive you're using or uh, you know what access you have and then uh, say you have certain levels of API keys like what would you probably go through as an attacker this is the fun question <laughs> uh, yeah so um, part of it is what permissions you have there's different ways of, of checking that out um, there are some AWS services that uh, CloudTrail doesn't support. So making, because uh, what you don't want to do is, hey, like, can I delete stuff, list stuff? And then that flags, a, um, starts flagging your activity on um, the big screen in the dungeon where your uh, emergency response team is, um, and they come after you. So you gotta be subtle and first see, okay, do I, do I have permissions? What, Am I getting good responses back from these other services, or am I getting permission denied? From there, um, at some point, you, you do have to sort of um, show up on the radar, so to speak. Um, you'll have to make some API calls that are going to be um, show up in CloudTrail. But it depends if someone's watching those. Generally, most of the time, people, um, many organizations don't look for um, suspicious activity. So um, net, what Netflix does is they give everyone a base profile and then they audit and remove permissions that haven't been used in a certain number of days. Um, this is a really good thing to do. Most people don't do it. Um, and so from that standpoint, right, maybe like uh, they're only near the um, investigation teams looking for deletes or t termination requests. They're not looking for listing requests. So you, you start with those. Um, you, uh, if you can find the CloudTrail bucket and list the CloudTrail permissions, then there's some ways that you can try and circumvent that um, by turning it off and on. Um, there's, uh, so that's one possible way of doing it. Turning CloudTrail off is generally pretty noisy because that's a big red flag to anyone watching that, hey, I'm trying to hide what I'm doing here. Uh, but if you know, if you're there for persistence, low and slow is the way to go. See if you can just watch what's happening in the account, learn the lay of the land. Um, if you want, if you're there to smash and grab, then maybe you don't care. If you flip off CloudTrail, that gives you uh, a few minutes of, uh, of time that no one's gonna, you know, that before that end of file, like CloudTrail has been ended, uh, API call gets recorded and moved up through the streams and I mean, if you have this stuff scripted out, um, I mean, two minutes is a long time in an API-driven world. You can disable CloudTrail, and then the next line, you know, start triggering off uh, all the other stuff you can do. Um, that may not be a, a super helpful answer because it kind of depends what you're you're trying to attack. Um, there's different ways and theories of going about it, so we can we can talk afterwards and uh, about ways to to try and get around some of these things. There are other questions, or are we out of time? I think that's all we have time for cool. questions. We're going to go ahead and take a quick 30-minute break. Thank yeah. you, Brennan. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.